Okay, so we're almost there. Barely one hour, maybe not even a whole hour left. Um, it's been a very good day. You've been sitting, my feet are getting tired. I had to stretch a little bit uh, during the break. So what I want to do now is share with you a little bit of the data that I and my colleagues have collected that, that shows different ways of testing whether just in time teaching is working well in a particular class. So um, there, there's sort of different styles of, of testing, of, of assessment. Um, and I want to give you a flavor of several different types. So this first set of data, these will take a little bit more study than some of my other slides. Uh, this was done uh, by a colleague of mine at IEPUI in the biology class with about 155 students participating. And what we did was we said, okay, um, just at, around the midterm exam time, we said, well, there's no warm-up question because there's going to be an examination. So there's no need to have a warm-up question. But students are used to answering a question at this time every day, every week. So let's use that assignment to ask the, a, a micro survey. Only three questions, each question only yes or no. And these were the three questions. The first question is, do the warm-ups help you stay quiet? Yes or no? The second question is, do you cram? before a test to this class. I'm not sure if you can translate this word cram. It means to study very, very hard. People are smiling or not. Yes. It means the same thing in every language. Uh, try to cram information into your head at the last minute before an exam. Yes or no? And then do you cram in your other classes this semester? And these are the results. And what we did was we broke the results down by what grade the student had in the course as of the midterm. So as of the midterm, the students who were getting an A, 85% say the warm-ups help them stay quiet. And in fact, regardless of what grade they are in, A, B, C, D, or F, always between 85 and 92% of students say yes, this helps me stay quiet. So at least from that point of view, we feel pretty good that, that the students at least understand that this is useful to them in that way. Now this next question, do you cram before your tests in this class? I found this very interesting. I was not expecting this. But only 14% of the A students say they cram in this class. Whereas 43% say they cram in their other classes. So this is really showing that those A students, not only the 85% say they are caught up, but they really put it into practice. They believe it. They feel like the exam is coming. They don't even need to study that hard. They're, they're so well caught up. And we have the comparison to the same students in the other classes they're taking. So we really feel like it's a, it's a fair comparison. We're not asking them, because if you just ask the students, do you cram for these tests, then you don't know. Well, do they cram in other classes, or is this just the way they are as a person? Is this their study habits? But by asking this, comparing these two questions together, then we can really find out what's the result of this class and separate that from what is this group of students normally behaving? For the B students, the difference is a bit less striking. 39% now are crowded, much more than 14%, but still less than the 61% of those same students behavior in another class. The C students, again, even more of them are cramming, and the difference is growing smaller still. And by the time you get down to the poor students, the students who are getting a B or an F as of the midterm, their behavior is exactly the same. And bad behavior, cramming for the test, probably only as their only form of study, 
Um, and there's no difference between this class and any other. Even though they say that this is helping them stay caught up, they still don't see a need to change their behavior. This is really telling us something about the way students are approaching the class. And it's telling us that um, the better students are really getting a huge benefit out of it. The weaker students, probably not so much. And I'm sorry to say that this is often the case with almost any change you can make in uh, teaching style, teaching methodology, is that the A students are the ones who are most likely to do what you ask. And thus, they wind up being the ones who benefit the most. And the students who are doing very poorly are the students who never pay any attention to the professor, so it doesn't matter what you do. It's not quite that bad. We do actually get some benefit. We move some students from here up to there, from there up to there. But the, the lower level ones, and, and I will tell you, we're, we're a public university, and as I said before, we have students that have many distractions. Some of these students are students that don't even show up. I mean, they come to class on the first day of class and you never see them again. And then you see them around the first exam, you ask them, well, where have you been? And they say, oh, well, you know, my job, uh, my boss asked me if I could do it at another chef. So I've actually been working nights and I sleep during the day. And you say, well, you're still taking the class? Yeah, I guess, you know, I have to. So, you know, we really have some students that are struggling for many reasons, and we try to find out about those, but, you know, this group down here, it's, it's hard to reach them. So, here's a very different measure. This, what, what we measured, I'm sure you can't read this, this vertical axis on each of these graphs is the percentage of students who begin the class that either drop out of the class before it's over, or get a D or a failing grade. So it's the percentage of students that did not succeed. And what you have here, this is our introductory calculus-based mechanics class, an intro physics class for engineers. And this is what was happening before just in time teaching, and then this is what's happening after. This graph here, this is the second semester, the calculus based electricity and magnetism. And again, this is before, just in time teaching and after. There's a fair amount of scatter, but the, these horizontal lines are the means of those data points and the mean of those data points. The mean there and the mean there. And one thing I would like to point out is that uh, in both this case and this case, many of these data points in the using just-in-time teaching category are not any of the people who are, who are involved in designing the method. These are colleagues of ours who said, okay, you know, it's our turn to teach that big class. We'll give it a try and use the same methodology that you did. And, you know, it's the same before. So it's the same people in both cases, before and after, a mix of two or three people in each course. This is a second semester calculus class. And what happened is here, this is before just the time of teaching. This is after it was introduced. These two data points are somebody else that came in and said, I don't care what these results are, this looks stupid to me and I'm not doing it. And then, Failure rate went right up to where it was before. So the department chair said, okay, if you're going to be stubborn, you're out of there. We'll give it back to somebody else who will do it this way. And the results are right back in the good level. And, and this is this biology class that had that survey done that I showed you on the previous slide. In every case that we've introduced this technique, the results have been like this, somewhere around a 30 to 50 percent reduction in the percentage of the class that really is lost. The ones who drop out, the ones who fail. So it's a pretty su substantial improvement, and this is held up over many semesters 
and with many people using the technique. Now, this is uh, back again to a biology class, and this is probably the hardest one to understand. So, what we did was we had final exam questions that came twice. So, the, so the question was asked first early in the semester on a survey type thing, and then asked again on the final exam. And what we look at here is the difference in the percentage that got it right at the end from the percentage that got it right at the beginning. And then this is this so-called normalized gain. Uh, is anyone familiar with this, this quantity normalized gain? No, not many. Okay. Let me explain what this is. So you take this number, the post minus pre. So this is the amount of improvement in the percentage of students who got the question right. And you divide that by 100% minus the percent that got it right on the first trial. So in other words, you divide by the amount of gain that was possible. So let's say, as an example, 30% of the students got it right on the first time, and 60% got it right on the second time. So in this column, there would be 30% minus, or excuse me, 60% minus 30% would be 30%. Over here, you would have 30% divided by 70%. Which is 100 minus 30. So it's so it's the, the gain 30 percent divided by 100 minus the initial value. So that's divided by the total amount of gain possible. If you went from if you go to 100 percent, this will be one. If the class gets worse, this will be a negative number. Okay. So that's what these two columns are. Now here. This describes how we're trying to affect the results. So this is all in one semester, one group of students. Some of these questions that were asked, both beginning and end, we didn't do anything special. It was just either they learned that from doing lectures, the homework, it was just the same class as it had been in previous semesters. 15% get better by the end a gain of 0.17. So only 17% only of the possible improvement was achieved by the normal teaching of the class. It's pretty disappointing. You teach the class as well as you can, only 17% improvement, that's not so good. So here we said, okay, let's add some special homework problems that are very similar to those types of questions. Maybe that will help. You know, you target those things. In fact, the difference is very small, not even statistically significant. So instead of 15% improvement, 17% improvement. And the gain goes from 0.17 to 0.21. Still not very good. Only 20%, 21% of the possible improvement is achieved. Then this one, we said one of two things happened. Either we have a warm-up exercise and do just-in-time teaching on that topic, or we have some activity in class where students work in a group uh, doing, a, it wasn't necessarily peer instruction, but something where they talk as a group in class. And here the jump is up to 45%, uh, over 50% of the possible group. And then we said, okay, we'll do both both the warm-up and the in-class discussion problem, then we get up to 56% 56, 56 difference for a gain of 64% uh, of the possible gain. So it's, it's much better. Can we have the microphone up here? You can just pass it along. Perfect Eh, me preguntaba, eh, 
¿Qué tipo de exámenes hacen ustedes a sus estudiantes? Si les hacen preguntas de selección única o si les hacen eh, problemas de desarrollo o preguntas de conceptos. Eh, y también la otra pregunta sería, ¿cuántos exámenes les hacen al semestre? Para que sepan, nosotros lo que hacemos aquí, por lo menos en física, son eh, entre 3 y 4 exámenes por semestre todo, eh, y todos de, de desarrollo, ya sea de respuestas cortas o desarrollo de problemas. No sé si tiene alguna opinión al respecto, si algún método le parece mejor que el otro. Yo entiendo que muchas veces está asociado con cuántos estudiantes tiene uno. Pero si usted considera que hay algún método de examinar que sea mejor que el otro, y cuál recomienda. Ok, good question. So, um, the answer is, is different for me in physics than it is for my colleagues in biology. So, this data was based on multiple choice tests. This is a class with about 300 students in uh, total, total enrolled. Because there was 155 just answering one survey. So it's probably a couple, maybe, maybe only 200, 250. Something in that way. So, so they're asking all multiple choice questions. Uh, in physics, I think, and, and I think they probably are similar as in physics. Three exams during the semester and then a final exam which is comprehensive. Um, in physics, my tests are typically uh, three to five multiple choice questions, which are, tend to be uh, a little bit easier, and then three or four uh, problem solving problems. And I think that's a, a reasonable mix. I have colleagues at the University of Illinois who have 3,000 students per semester in introductory physics. It's one of the biggest engineering schools in the United States. And so they have done, despite the fact that they have, I think, 40 teaching assistants, 40 graduate students per semester, per class, they still do multiple choice questions. And they did one semester, maybe two, where they did some of each, they, they divided the class in half, and some had multiple choice at the beginning of the semester, and then problem solving at the end, and the other group had the reverse, and what they found was that they were very highly correlated. So they felt like the multiple choice exams were okay, um, and they were just so overwhelmed with the number of students that they made that conversion. Personally, I don't like multiple choice questions, but I understand, you know, I have 150 students, I have three other professors helping me out to do the grade. If they were gone, I would do multiple choice too. So, in the data that I'm showing you, it's a mix depending on which class. So the physics class, I think, we're all multiple, we're all problem solvers. Calculus, I believe, is also all problem solving. And the biology is either mostly multiple choice or all multiple choice. So this, this word, effective, this is, again, some education jargon. Um, effective domain assessment means it's asking the students how they feel about things or how they think about things. It's sort of that. Um, self-reported, um, more, more personal attitude questions, as opposed to questions of grades or you know answers on multiple choice or other things that can be independently verified and which are um, measures of, of their learning. This is questions of their feeling. And Again, it's probably hard for you to read, but I'll, I'll explain this. This was again done in that format of we replace one of the warm-up exercises right around the exam with a survey, where they just have a few questions and they're, they're either yes or no, so it takes just five minutes. And I would say we're asking them these questions on the day that they have an exam or sometimes the day before they have an exam. If there was any time for them to feel bad about the course, this would be it. So if the results are positive, then I think if you ask them at a different time, it can only be better. 
So here are some of the questions. And, and we find when we're doing this, it's very useful to pair these questions. So we ask them about what we're doing, and we ask them about their classes. That way, we really find out what they're thinking about this class in comparison, as opposed to just what they're thinking, and then leaving us to wonder if that's just the way they think about everything, or if we're special in some way. So this first pair says, do you feel that the warm-up assignments helped your professor make good use of classroom time? And this, this was in the electricity and magnetism class. That's the idea. Uh, and then, do your other professors have better ways to determine how class time should be used? Now the first question, 87% of the class says that the warm-up assignments help the professor make good use of the time. Only 26% say that other professors have a better way of using class time. So I consider that to be very positive. Uh, students are feeling that the warm-up assignments are actually making the class time more useful to them than they would be other things. This next pair, do you feel that the warm-up assignments helped your professor focus on important topics in class? And again, a paired question. Do your other professors have effective methods for focusing on important topics? So 91% say yes. This helps the professor focus on important topics. They also say 61% of their other professors have effective methods. We didn't ask, do they have more effective methods? If I was to do it again, I would ask the question that way. Do they have more effective ways? Because the way this is asked, students will say, well, you know, sure, they do important things. But, and so I think what this is saying is that they generally like their classes. Thanks, their professors, 60%, uh, have effective ways of figuring out what to do in class. Uh, but that by using just the time of teaching, by using warm up assignments, it goes up to 90%. So again, very positive. Uh, this third pair, did the warm up assignments help your professor get a good feel for what students know? And then the other professors have effective methods for getting a feel for what their students know. And here it's closer. Still, 81% quite a good number said that the warm-up assignments help, this, help the professor have a good sense of what they know. And here, I would compare this 38% to the 61%. 61% of their other professors have effective methods for focusing on important topics, but only 38% have an effective way of finding out what the students understand. So, going from here to here, the world of science is making even bigger improvements as compared to their other professors. And then this last pair says, do you think the world of science help your professor get students involved during the lectures? And do your other professors have effective ways to get their students involved in the lecture? Uh, this 70% it's a little low compared to the 81, 91, 87 percent. And I'll tell you, this was before I started using the vote. I think if I did this survey again now, it would probably be, this number would probably be up in the 80s again. Not because of the warm-ups, because of the way the warm-ups are combined with the peer instruction. And that's, you know, I've become a great believer in peer instruction. Eric Mazur and James Frazier have really convinced me uh, that this is, this is a great match. Uh, and, you know, the other professors, 43%, it's, it's not great, but it's not, you know, it's better than, than 26%. So, uh, you know, this is not to say that all professors have to do just in time teaching because, you know, everything else is bad. It's, it's to say that just in time teaching is a way of improving. Even a very good professor can get an even better result by taking this method or peer instruction or some combination 
And, and there are other things that you may hear about in the future as well, I'm not sure. Um, these are just some student comments. These are things that, again, they can write down free response. What do you think about this course? And what am I getting? This was a fantastic course. It was the hardest course I've taken yet, but also the most fun. I like that. I think the warm-ups are a good idea because they give students a chance to think about the material prior to lecture. This actually reveals something. Because for many years, always, and in many of their courses, there's always an assumption, a reading assumption. They always had a chance, you know, to me, they always had a chance to think about the subject before lecture. So, so what does this mean? It doesn't mean that they're given a chance. It's that they're given a better chance. They're given a guidance about how to think about the subject before lecture. That's the way I would interpret that. Some other students, I didn't add this, but sometimes students use the word allow. The warm-ups allow me to think about the subject before lecture. The warm-ups allow me to prepare for class. It's like, who's preventing you before from preparing for class? They were preventing themselves because they don't know how to prepare for class. They've not been coached on what does it mean to prepare for class. You give them a reading assignment, they think, okay, so I look at the pages in the book, but that's not the same as thinking about what are the important ideas in this, what kinds of questions would be useful for me to think about. That's, that's what the just in time teaching can really begin to teach the students, is how to prepare. What kinds of things should I ask myself as I prepare for class? This class was very well structured. It was obvious that a lot of time was spent in preparation for it. This was my point that I made earlier about your students will, will be much more inclined to work hard if they see that you work hard. If they see, oh, this guy put a lot of time into preparing for this class. There was a beautiful website. All of the materials were well written. It was well structured. The calendar was easy to read. It was well, well done. Um, you know, I think we all appreciate whether it's our computer or our appliances in our kitchen or our, our car, uh, our camera or our cell phone. If something works really well, you appreciate it. You like it. And when you like something, you're more inclined to use it. If you feel like you're using a computer program or a phone, if you constantly have to look at the manual, because you can't figure out how to use it, then you kind of figure out how to use 70% of the features, and you just say, oh, forget it. That's good enough. I can, I can do what I have to do. I can send text messages. I can look at my email. That's it. I'm not going to bother to figure out how to integrate it with my calendar. But if it's really easy to use, and it's really clear, then you wind up using more of the features. Um, there's a book that I'd like to recommend. I've actually been reading kind of on the side lately. It's called The Design of Everyday Things. Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a book that's worth reading. It's um, something that, that I recommend you look at. And think about what it would mean to design a course in the way that a computer program or a product that you use or a device is designed. What does it mean to design something? As an engineering school, I'm sure there are some great uh, engineering design professors here who are familiar with this idea. Um, but I think it's something that more of us should bring into our thinking about how to design a class, how to design a homework assignment. Um, these classes, these, these are the course numbers for mechanics and electricity and magnetism have made me reach more than any classes I've ever taken. This is again to say these are difficult classes. The students are still feeling pretty good about it. And I love this last comment. It says, don't tell anyone, but I think I will greatly miss my physics class. 
I'm not sure. I think I will break into this one because it's like that's that's again three thousand five. So to summarize, just the kind of teaching based on feedback between the homework and the classroom. The number one tool to create that feedback is the warm-up exercise. It's a free class online reading clips. I think you all now know intimately what this is. Uh, some of the improvements that you'll see are improved study habits for your students, improved retention, that is more of your students complete the class successfully, uh, improved knowledge, they understand the subject better, uh, and improved morale. They feel better about the class. They actually feel more positive, like it was a learning experience, not too big. And the instructors gain a deeper knowledge of the difficulties that students have. And I would also like to repeat again that just in time teaching is easy to adapt to a new situation. I'm doing it in physics, in introductory classes. After I did it a few years like that, I actually did it in some uh, advanced statistical mechanics classes. I have colleagues who've done it in, in uh, electricity and magnetism in the upper division. In M class, people have done it in calculus, biology, chemistry, and then more recently, people have started doing this in political science and management. I have a whole group of people uh, in our nursing schools that are doing it with uh, student nurses. Um, so there, there are many different settings in which it can be done. Uh, I have one colleague in, who, who tried doing this in a graduate class. In, and what he did was simply get rid of all the content questions and just say, okay, there's a lot of reading for this class. Uh, it's sort of an uh, instrumentation class. Uh, the students are reading about all different types of detectors and, and uh, electronic systems. And, and the question was just for each class, what part of the reading would you like us to spend the most time on each class? And that was the only warm-up assignment, just day after day, week after week, what part would you like to see us spend the most time on in class? And for the graduate students who are very sophisticated and very well motivated, that was all that it took to get them to read the thing and decide which part was the most confusing and give them some clues as to what to do uh, during the classroom time. So, next steps. So tomorrow, we're going to have the group um, from your uh, institutional uh, technology department come and do a demonstration, 15, 20 minutes, of one platform that you could use that the university already has set up and which they could actually, in principle, adjust if, you, if many people want some new features added to support just-in-time teaching, they indicated they could potentially implement some new technology to be more supportive of this. I think if you have a group of people who are willing to do that, that's great. We should take advantage of them. Uh, I will also, if I can get on the internet, uh, show you how to do this with Google Forms, which is another way of doing it, uh, which I find very convenient, and which you will experience uh, tonight. So we'll, we'll have some more practice writing uh, warm-up questions. We've gone through one round, had some good discussions. I think you now have an even deeper idea of how to write those questions so that they're really open-ended, so the students reveal their thinking in the process of answering the question. Um, we'll discuss a little bit more how to use students' responses. And then we'll have uh, potentially some additional discussion of some uh, additional things that couple well with what you've learned so far. Um, so now I give you another assignment. I want everybody to do this. So this is the same website that I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk. And Monica wanted me to be sure to repeat it. So write that URL down or take a picture of it. 
On that site, you'll find all my slides, including the skeleton of tomorrow, although tomorrow is not going to be so PowerPoint-based as today. Um, also, the, the handout that I gave you, you can print out multiple copies, share those with your colleagues here, um, use them again as a guide to run any warm-up questions. There are links to those online archives. But most importantly, so has everybody got that URL now? Anybody need the last second to take a picture? Okay, let's see, yes. This one, the last picture we can take. Okay. Good. So a little bit of on the escape from PowerPoint, which I always like to escape from PowerPoint. So I couldn't get on one, but what? That link doesn't work? Uh-oh. Has anyone else tried it? Yes? Working? Uh, it's working for you? Okay. Several people have it's working. Uh, I'll, show, I'll put it up again. And, and it's not case sensitive, by the way. Um, so once you get there, this is what that page will look like. This is a local copy, so I could get online at all. But um, up here, I apologize, this is in English, but it's kind of an explanation of what is the purpose of one of these workshops and, and how just in time teaching works. Um, this link here is to the assignment that you did in advance of this workshop, so you can see what the questions were once again. And then this link here is the one that I want you to go to. So if you click on that, it should take you to a Google form with just two or three questions. Put in your name, answer the questions. Can be quite brief. Don't, you don't need to give me uh, some of the answers that you gave before today were very good, very detailed. I understand it's been a long day. So if you want to give me as much detail as possible, that's great. But if you only want to give me three sentences, I'll understand. Mostly, the idea is to help me see what to do tomorrow and for you to experience what that form is like. Um, these links down here are to, this first one is to today's presentation, the slides that we've been living in all day. Um, these are tomorrow's slides. This is the handout. And this here, just to be sure, in case my internet connection doesn't work tomorrow, and I can't show you how the Google form works. I did a screen movie of myself creating a Google form. It's less than three minutes long from logging in to creating a warm-up exercise with a couple questions and getting the URL to send to the students. Less than three minutes. So it's quite an easy process. Has anyone else tried it? Is, is that link working? Okay, the link is working. Very good. Um, is this link working? Does anyone want to try clicking on that now? It works? Okay, great. So the technology it would seem works. You have your assignment for tomorrow. We're a little bit early. But I would say that I can answer any questions that people have now. But I think it would be best to withhold uh, more presentation until tomorrow. Okay, we have a question. Can we get the microphone again? Where is the microphone now? Uh, okay. Is the microphone still in this place? Okay, there it goes. Send it this way. Great. Okay. Something. Try to try again. Okay. I'm not sure if they're ready. Yeah. So, okay, ready? The question is, with the calendar of calendar, do you have a calendar? 
¿Prepara el material que yo tengo que leer o utiliza directamente los libros de texto? O sea, yo también quiero saber qué, qué parte del trabajo se requiere. O sea, supongo que hay que preparar materiales para la lectura de los estudiantes o bien seleccionar los textos que uno va a recomendar para, para su lectura. Y, y yo quisiera que usted nos explicara cuál es el que se utiliza. ¿Cómo se hacen los puntos? Ok. So, uh, in, in most cases, it's simply the textbook. So, whatever textbook I'm using in the class, um, depending on which class it is, I may be using it in more detail or less. But if I'm assigned, if I want my students to pay money, which they don't have a lot of, uh, they're going to be paid for that textbook, then I want them to see that I, I find it valuable. So, I assign the readings out of that. Uh, and then the warm-up questions are based on their understanding of that reading. Now, I can imagine a situation, probably not in an undergraduate physics class, but either in a graduate class or in another subject area, where you might, for instance, be asking students to read journal articles, or asking them to read some material online that you have located, um, or possibly even something that you've written yourself. To me, to have to write the entire textbook, to write the whole subject matter of the course, would be very, very overwhelming. I, I have tried to write a textbook, and it did not go well. So, um, I, I wouldn't try that again easily. Um, I have sometimes if I think, for instance, that the textbook that I'm using has, has a, a weak spot, added some, you know, written some material for one or two days' worth of classes. And in that case, that would become the assignment that students would read before doing the warm-up. But in general, I wouldn't attempt to write the whole subject of my class. I would either use an assigned textbook or some other materials that I can point my students to to read. Okay. Other questions? Todo el tiempo, profesor. ¿Cuánto dura usted preparando este tipo de clases con respecto a la clase tradicional? Cuando el profesor llega a la clase y Yeah, so uh, this, this, um, this touches on a very important point. It takes a little bit longer on a day to day basis. So, if I have a class that I'm teaching for several years in a row, the first time I do it, it just takes some time to prepare all these warm up questions. Because it takes some thinking. I mean, you had that experience earlier today, and we'll do it again tomorrow where you write some questions. And you can see that it could take half an hour or an hour to write good questions to use for one day's class. So if you have 20 classes or 30 classes an entire semester, it could take you 20 or 30 hours, so a couple of days' work, to prepare all the questions. Then, of course, teach that class again, you don't need to do all that time again. You may need to make some adjustments. If some of the questions didn't give you what you wanted, you may need to re rewrite some of them or make some adjustments. But um, the, let's say it might be down to five or ten hours the second time, and by the third time, fourth time, your questions are pretty well set. Then. The, the other question, not, not of preparing the, for the semester, but of doing it on a day-to-day -day basis during the semester. I would say, in my case, for each class, I spend about 25, 20 minutes, maybe 40, 45 minutes at the most, reviewing what my class has answered to decide how to change the topic, uh, what areas to emphasize, 
what of their um, their answers to use in class and putting them you know, into some printed form so that I can bring it to class. Uh, how I do that depends on what technology is in the classroom. Um, so, and, and that I would say, again, you know, maybe it's a little bit longer the first time, but it, that, the amount of time it takes to do that goes down with practice also. Um, now, this raises another important question, which is what is a reasonable amount of time for a professor to spend preparing to teach a class at all? It is possible if you take teaching a class to me and writing down what you know on a piece of paper and then going and copying, copying it onto the board in the presence of your students, then it takes you an hour for each class to write out your lecture notes the first time you teach it. And then after that, there's zero additional time. Personally, I don't think that's fair to the students. Uh, I get to pay the salary, and it comes from a public university, so it comes from their, their tuition, and from their paying taxes, and their families paying taxes. So I feel like, you know, if it takes me an extra half an hour per class to prepare, uh, for 30 classes, so 15 hours of extra work over the course of the entire semester. And that's not too much for them to ask. Them. So, I would say in answer to your question, the first time you teach a class, it could take 30 to 50 hours total spread over the entire semester to get everything done the first time. The second time, it might be 20 or 30 extra hours, after that, it's maybe 15 hours uh, in steady state to just keep keep doing it with the same questions. Uh, and that's, I find that reasonable. It depends on how many classes you're teaching and uh, how big they are and how much research responsibility you have and other responsibilities. There is some extra work, but I think it's, it's not too much and it's worth it in the improvement in your students. Um, you know, I'd like to, to say this, you know, one, one, of the, uh, one of my colleagues has said this to me several times, you know, if your students do a bad job in class, it's very frustrating. You know, it, it's not a good life if every semester your job is to go into a class and tell students about a subject that, that you personally think is quite useful. And they make a mockery of it and don't learn you know, even half of what you want. And then they argue and complain about the grades. It's just miserable for everyone. But if you really show them, okay, you care about what they know and you want to make the class better for them as well as for you by using this technique to find out what they know and make adjustments, it makes you happy. And those 15 hours are well worth it. Profesor, sí. cuando uno va, nosotros damos cursos de servicio, química, bueno, matemática, física, son de servicio, y, muy, y los estudiantes del primer ingreso vienen un poco, vienen en Coama, con malos hábitos de estudio y todo eso, y con, con pensamientos de, de, de que esos cursos hay que pasarlos para empezar a aprender ya lo que quieren realmente estudiar. Entonces, el, el poder de uno meterlos a que les, que, que, que les interesa, que les interesa es aprender lo que uno les da, porque es base de todo lo, que, lo demás es difícil. Entonces, a veces nos encontramos con eso. Ellos nada más quieren pasar ese curso de química y, y cacho, no meterse en mucho problema. Y, y vienen del colegio que quieren que el profesor le ponga lo, en la pizarra lo que va a hacer en el examen y punto. Y cambiar esta mentalidad es muy difícil. Es muy difícil, me acuerdo. Lo que estás describiendo es exactamente la situación en la que estoy enseñando también. Uh, el semestre que estoy enseñando es una clase de servicio. 
Maquette, I uh, introductory physics for the engineering school. I have 150 students, probably 20 are in physics, chemistry, and mathematics combined. And the other 130 are from engineering. And they have exactly the attitudes which you've described, both in terms of their study habits, which they learned in high school, and also in terms of their attitude that this is something to be gotten over with, and then they can move on to the subject that they really want. It's, it's so similar, um, it's, it's astonishing. I mean, there's no difference between our countries, between our universities in this area. Um, and, and I will say, this, this is not a perfect solution. You will not have a miracle in which all of your students abruptly love you. Uh, I'm sorry to say that, but it's true. The issue is not to have a miracle. The issue is to shift the distribution so that it's significantly better, measurably better. Um, and to me, that's, that's a success. If instead of 40% of the students have bad attitude, but only 30% of the students have bad attitude. If only, instead of 30% of the students fail in the class, only 20% of the students fail in the class. If uh, just, just a handful, I mean physics, I suspect it's the same here as it is in the United States, the number of physics students is tiny compared to the number of engineering students. Number of chemistry students a little bit bigger, but still not as big as engineering. And nobody has as many students as psychology and business. And so we, to me, if I can take a class of 150 students and three of them decide to change majors to physics, wow, that's great. I may have just doubled the number of physics majors in my class. Uh, and that does happen, and we have seen a significant number of increasing physics majors as a result of treating them well, treating them with respect, giving them a class that's clearly, fundamentally designed for their benefit, and telling them so on the first day of class. So, a miracle, no. But Definitely, even in that situation which you described, they can improve the student's study habits. Not make them perfect, but they can improve them. You can convince a few students that physics or chemistry really is a wonderful thing. Maybe they don't become a chemistry major, but maybe material science at least. Um, so they begin to see the value of this. And also, I think it's fair to say that look, the engineer, it's the engineering school, your professors in engineering that tell you to take this class. It's not up to, to the chemistry department to decide what's required for engineering students. It's up to the engineering faculty to decide what is required for engineering students. They must have some reason for requiring this. I will attempt to it's my job to show you by the end of the semester what that reason is. And in fact, I'll give you just a little hint of what could come tomorrow. I have a whole set of assignments which I don't give in a very big class, but in a somewhat smaller class I do, which are all that, that wonderful thing, extra credit for students. And they're titled, the title of the assignment is What is Physics Good For? And each time they have to answer the question, what is physics good for? Um, it's sort of an addition to just the time teaching. It's not essential, but it's a nice addition. And I'll show that to you tomorrow. And again, the number, once you start assigning that, the number of students that come to you and say, I don't understand why I have to do this, goes to zero. Some of them they still think it, but fewer think it. And then you have say, oh, okay, now I understand. Why is the engineering school requiring you to take physics? I can see why. I can see what it's doing. Mm -hmm. Others? One question. 
Okay.